I think what would that be kind of some kind of clairvoyance about the past and future, or etc. But, but I think that in my case, it will be more the energy to the zoom out because of the kind of short sightedness. So if you know Mr. Darmo, so I have the, the, a tendency to only see the things which are like big mountains because I, I'm so short sighted that I tend to miss every important detail. So most of what I would say would be wrong. So here you see Mr. Lewis, his character, he's very short sighted, but he refuses to wear glasses because he, is, he thinks that the world is like it's here. And so he's convinced that he's cutting the, the plants, but it can be seen. So here comes the moment. Okay, so, Stage one, if you know the the Christmas Carol by Dickens, it was composed in five stages down from the past, present, and future. So let, let's start with the past, which for neon anatomy is very, very old. So it started with make maybe the first um, words in neon anatomy that we remember, maybe those of Aristotle, who was studying comparative neon anatomy, looking at different species. And for a long time, uh, I don't know any Greek, and, but uh, I tried to imagine what anatomy would mean. And, so the Greek word is that, and I thought well, anatomy, you have the ana, like analogous, you know, when, when something has the same explanation, maybe ana means kind of the same. And then thomas, at the end, that may be some section or di dividing a thing. And so I thought maybe it's neuroanatomy is about trying to divide or and cut together things which are the, the, the same. And in fact, I, I got it completely wrong. Because after that, I asked a philosopher friend, and the, the ten, ten no part, it uh, means it's kind of related to a section, but Anna means just to cut, cut up. So in fact, anatomy means just to cut up. <laughs> and the thing is that you have a knife, and then you try to cut up, and then you, you kind of tend to cut things which belong to the same organ. You know, it's most easy to separate, I don't know, the liver from the from the gut than cut through the liver or the, and it's really very good. So this is, for example, uh, from the 15th century, you have here the, the anatomy of the horse in, as it was conceived in, in Egypt. And also in Japan, this is the uh, 17th century. So you have also some some first brain anatomy. Well, not, not, not even first, but it, it's been with, with us for a very long time. And you can see that well, it's, especially in this school, it's quite amazing because of the, the level of detail that they got for different organs like like the heart, etc. was quite precise. But then for the brain, they, it, it was very uh, schematic. Maybe because I know better the brain than the heart. But I think it's also because when you just cut the brain, what you see is something like this. So you, you, you will get, these are just slices in this direction. And you tend to see the, the gray matter there, the kind of brownish part, and then the white matter, which is all the, now we know it's all the, the axons that connect the different neurons in different regions in the brain. Uh, but it's quite homogeneous. Okay? There, there's a lot of things that we can say with this, but you don't see much. Let's say. So it, it's difficult to, to make any progress. And I think that for a long time, it was difficult to make much of a progress because everything that we saw in the brain was quite homogeneous. And then, and then it started changing by the end of the 19th century when we became able to, to stain the brain. It was quite an amazing moment. And you will see it like, like the equivalent in your neuroscience of the Cambrian explosion just became huge. So for example, France, uh, Nissel uh, developed a technique that would stain all the nuclei of the cells. And, and it was maybe a broad man who would use these techniques to, the, to, the, to its most. And the, the, what, what you can see is something like this. So this is a, a zoom. I will go back. So the, what I'm zooming is a region like, for example, this part, you know, the, the brownish part. And what you can see is that all the, every dot is one cell. And you can see that, that there's a heterogeneity. So it, what, what seemed to be continuous, it's in fact heterogeneous. And then they started to to realize that there are in, within this cortex, which is in humans, kind of two millimeters and a half, there are different layers. You know? And very often you have kind of the same, the same six main layers, but some of them, and, and this is one special region that people later uh, realize that that's the, the division between the primary visual cortex and the secondary visual cortex. And if you do like Mr. Magu and close a little bit your eyes, you will see here kind of a, a very abrupt change in layers with two dark bands fusing into only one in what now we call layer four. 
And then looking at that type of difference, people started, started making this type of maps. So what seemed to be homogeneous was in fact uh, a very heterogeneous and interesting map. For example, this is a, a human brain. And every time that, that Rodman saw a difference in, in the type of uh, composition of the cerebral cortex, he, he would use a different type of uh, dots to, to move the patient. So here we have, for example, the, this, this, this is the motor cortex, and this is the somatosensory cortex. Here in the inside part of the brain, to the back, you have the primary and primary visual cortex, and also very, so the, the difference that, that we were looking at in the previous slides is this difference here. And it was, as I said, uh, some kind of explosion. You know, and at that time, um, it, it wasn't very recent. And that, that may be one of the, the main drawbacks of anatomy, neuroanatomy at that time. But it was very rich. So they started making maps of everything. And this is the same book by, by Goldman. So this is a cortical map for the genome. You know. And here you have the cortical map for the manuscript. They were just looking at different brains, people trying to measure. The, the same analysis and then starting to learn uh, starting to learn about the evolution of the brain, making the questions how those these differences relate to the development of intelligence, for example. Can we see some something that, that would make the human brain special? Uh, this is uh, the mirror. Again or, or the maps you see for, for smaller animals the maps tend to be simpler and, and there's also less cortical folding. And then these are just more maps that I took from from Brodman's book. Uh, flying frogs, rabbit, hedge frogs. So it's very rich in the, in the type of species. People at the time were really very interested in the human brain, but also in, in a comparative perspective. And if, if you go to a neuro, neuroimaging lab today, people will be still using Brodman's map. So we, we don't have really something that would be today better than, than what he did at the beginning of the 20th century. So here what you saw for, was for each cell, it was just a dot. It's in fact the, the nucleus of the cell that, that this technique was able to spend. And But then there was this other technique, which was invented by Camilo Golgi, an Italian neuroscientist, but then also used at uh, its maximum by, by a, a Spanish researcher, Santiago, Santiago Ramón y Cajal. And this technique was very different to, to Nissel in some, some aspects, because it, it wasn't able to stain every single nuclei, every single cell. It just seemed to be staining randomly, some cells yes and some other cells no. But, but then instead of having just a point, what you had was something like this. Okay, so you have a very precise and a beautiful drawing of a single cell. Well, no, not a single cell, but, uh, at, at that time, the, if, if we go back, so this is, this is the, he was very happy because he was offered this super size microscope. <laughs> It may be what you are able to buy for your kids to be at the So all the work by Ramon Cajal was done with this type of microscope. And then so here you have the cell, and, and they were this, there, there was a big debate at the time. Uh, are cells, neurons connected, uh, so independent cells, or is it just a, a, a continuum of tissue? So are they, and the, the, that's what they call the, the neuron doctrine. So, so the Ramon Cajal was saying that neurons are uh, individual entities and then that they make connections. And uh, Camilo Golgi, on the other hand, was trying to say, what was arguing that, in fact, they were not able to see anything and what he observed was more populations of these cells. So he thought that they, it was just a continuum. And then they started again looking at the, the shape of these cells and then the, the, the architecture of these cells, the changes in cells in different species, in different tissues, different animals, different times. And they, they, they were doing this type of drawing. It was really an explosion. So from this, that look completely homogeneous, going, going to this type of precision in the, in the image. And they, they, they were astonishingly precise very often and, and all the time very beautiful. Like for example, this one. So those would be neurons where the dendrites there. So main apical axon. Just show you some of the nice images. There, there's a very beautiful book by Javier de Felipe that's uh, like an art book with, with all the, the neurons that they were looking at the time. And so that, that was the beginning of the 20th century. And I, I imagine that the, the labs at the time looked a, bit, a little bit like this. So this is what, what you could see today if you went to the 
Museum d'Histoire Naturelle in Paris. They have also maybe the one of the largest collections of vertebrate brains. But if you look at the dates, there's nothing older than the 50s, more or less, no? 31, 42. A lot of the brains were in the, the 20s or the, the end of the 19th century. But uh, at some point, something, something happened with, with neuroanatomy. That's kind of, there, there is something that we could maybe identify as the end of classical neuroanatomy. And if you look at what happened in the timeline of neuroscience in the 30s, it's this. <coughs> so Hans Berger uses human scalp electrodes to demonstrate demonstrate electroencephalography. So in the 20s, 30 again, uh, the first method to record single cell uh, sensory and motor axons. So also the, uh, being able to measure electrical activity. And this is the first circuit that was used to measure the electrical activity in motor motor neurons. So they, they were hanging weights to to, to, to to these cells. And then related to, to the way you would you would be able to see a different different uh, action potential, so a discharge of electricity. And on one hand, neuroanatomy was very descriptive. <coughs> what I showed you was just drawings, very often not well, completely not quantitative. Maybe you, but you can make a quantification of the volume, but it's really very, very descriptive. On the other hand, when you have this type of data, you, have a, you can have a series of numbers, and then you can analyze that in a more quantitative way. And also, I think that at that time, beginning of the 20th century, electricity was the, the, the impressive thing. So every, everyone, I have the impression that a lot of the people, or their interest at least, moved to, to the electricity, the dynamics of neural networks more than the anatomy, and then the anatomy was a little bit forgotten, but that would be the end of it, the classical part of Amazon. But then, so then there was, I think that now we are seeing a second life of uh, neuroanatomy. So the, this would be the ghost of the present neuroanatomy. And I think that it started, it's like some kind of, kind of parallel evolution from a, a different, different field. So I have the impression that it started, and again, it's like Mr. Magu, no? it's just my own, my own perception, which is most likely completely wrong. So you have here, by, by also end of the uh, 19th century, people starting to play with uh, x-rays. Now they are taking pictures of their hand very carefully like this. Well, they, uh, you wouldn't do that today. And, and they were able to, to get this type of picture. So this is Wilhelm Röntgen, and this is the, a picture of the, the first X-ray of, uh, of a hand or something. So this is his one, um, the first X-ray. But then it moved. So the, the, this had a, a immediate clinical application. You would, would be able to see inside someone uh, that's alive. You don't have to gut anyone. Is, and so the, this new line of evolution of neuroanatomy, it's clearly related with medicine. Okay, you, here you're trying to heal people. But then it moved to, so trying to get this into some more non-invasive type of technology, uh, it, it became what, what it's today magnetic resonance imaging. So this is the, the first image of a magnetic resonance uh, imaging scanner. And what you have here is, so one of those two guys is uh, Sir Peter Massive, and they, they came up with a method that would allow you to take, using just ma magnetic resonance, take pictures of someone's inside. So you have here two, well, several big magnets that would produce a, a very strong magnetic field in that direction, and then they were wearing, they were wearing some kind of coils that would produce gradients that would allow them to take pictures, which at the beginning were like this. So this is someone's torso and the arms, and you can see the heart in, in the center. I, I would imagine that it's that, but it's more imagination than really a, a heart. So th those are images of one of those two researchers, and this is the first uh, brain MRI. So those are the ventricles. Sorry, Roberto, in what year was this? Hmm? You know, in what year? 1970s. Okay. Thank you. And, and this is how uh, uh, an MRI looks today. Okay, we really get a very, very nice precision. So most of the time, if you were willing to participate in the project that we're running today at the Hospital Robert de Bray, you could come and have an MRI of your brain and get, get data like this. It's one millimeter uh, isotropic resolution. It will take just 45 minutes of your life, and you will get that one, and uh, an image of the main 
uh, tr tracks in your brain and also brain function. <coughs> and, and you can also, by the way, scan anything else. Right? It's not only for brain, these are tools. <laughs> <laughs> so you can have a beautiful MRI of fruits. But then again, it's very, again, it's descriptive. And if you go to the hospital, even today, what well, doctors are a bit quantitative, but more descriptive than anything. So they will just look at the image and say, ah, look here, there's a cyst, or, whatever, or this thing looks a little bit strange. Or they will compare just kind of, but it's not very quantitative. And I think that the big revolution was to try to make that quantitative. And I think that, that we have a thank for that, the, these two guys in particular. So one would be a French a doctor, Jean Talirac. He was an, an epileptologist working at Santan, Hospital Santan. And he invented, it, it's not really well, you, you would see later. And, and he invented what, what we call the Talirac coordinates. So the Talirac coordinates, uh, I will skip the other guy right for, for a second later. These are the Talirac coordinates. So the, the idea is very simple. It's, it's something that we do all the time with animals as well. So uh, uh, to try to know, because we are, we are trying to, to maybe take take away a, a piece of the brain of someone that's producing uh, seizures. But you, you don't know where it is. You, 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 can, you can look inside. So what you do is you, you put the brains in this box, and then he looked at the different proportions for different brains, and provided a coordinate system that would tell you, once you have the brain of someone in this box, you would know that coordinate, for example, uh, <coughs> minus 45 and plus 10 and minus 10 would be, let's say, the talents. Okay, so you would be able to put your electrode in that coordinate and know that you are more or less close to a time so without even knowing what you're doing, without seeing. And this very simple system, this kind of very simple idea, became like the, the lingua franca in, in neuroimaging. So every time that you see a result in a neuroimaging paper, even today, and it's, it has been the case for how much, maybe 20, more than 20 years, you will get this Talera coordinate, which allows you to compare different papers. It, it's not precise at all, but it gives you this, this kind of basic common ground. And I think that we'll have to thank this other guy, Harry Friston, for, for making this the case. So this, this is a, a, also a doctor, a, a British doctor, working at the KC King's College, I don't know, yeah. And he started trying to do statistical analysis with, it, with this data, really being quantitative. And uh, he's very active even today, he, well, very young. And the, the thing is that he talked with several statisticians, asking them how can we compare the brain of different people because, because I want to know, for example, Alzheimer's disease, what does it happen in the brain, etc. And everyone told him, no, this is just too complicated. It's no way you can analyze this data. Maybe in, in 50 years, come back and we will tell you what to do with it. But the, the, the guy, without any formal training in statistics, started learning by himself and came up with working with some other researchers, uh, inventing a method based on the Italian coordinates at the beginning to compare different brains and do this, even if, it, even if it's relatively wrong, there may be some part of true in So if you have enough data, maybe the errors will, will average out. And so you, you get this. This is, for example, what, what you would see in a, in a, in a new imaging paper today. So you get the, they, they did something, and then you have several regions, and then these x, y, z coordinates are uh, coordinates. And this is the type of, of precision that, that you can get when you when you align different brains of different people um, using the Talera coordinates. So this would be some of the the main folds in a, in a human brain, and you see that it's there is a lot of variability. And this issue of the variability that, that was kind of an, a source of annoyance for most of the doctors. Most of the doctors were interested in the in specific disease, for example. Where does Alzheimer's disease happen? Or where do I, uh, where does it light up when I see a face or when, when I am afraid or etc. So they wanted to get rid of this variability. And for that, and I think that that's kind of a, a, a major distinction of the second life of neonatomy, for that, they had to call engineers, or physicists, or people with a quantitative background. And they came up with, with methods, which at the, begin, at the beginning were very simple. This is, for example, so you wanted to, you have brains of different people. The brains of humans are very, very different one from the other. People <coughs> have half of the brain volume uh, than another one, and it's completely normal. 
So you have brains of different shapes, acquiring eventually different uh, positions in what you do, a very simple way of aligning them, similar to what Tanerak proposed, is just to, to get some very simple linear transformations. And here you can see uh, what happens when you, for example, rotate the brain, or make it shrink, or, or steal the decision. But then it, it became more and more complex. And when, so we started hiring more and more individuals. Here it's uh, an atlas uh, built at the Montreal Neurological Institute out of 152 brains. So they align 152 brains and they compute the average. And you, you get this, which is the MNI 152 uh, atlas. And then you can have, for example, uh, two people, let's say those two guys. And those are already aligned with the atlas. So the size was changed and the shape was changed, but just by, by scaling it, uh, to make it match the, the atlas. But you see here, for example, this person has a very big ventricle that whole there is a ventricle in the brain full with uh, cerebral spinal fluid, and it, it, stays, it stays big. So if you want to compare he, this point here, for example, between this person, you will be inside the ventricle, and for this other person, you will be in the white matter. Okay. So people starting, started coming up with nonlinear methods of registering the brains. So instead of just changing the size or rotating and translating, they would squish the brain as if it were some piece of uh, elastic material, soft material. And, and those are the same brains, so the same people. This guy, when you use this elastic transformation, it, it becomes like this, so much more similar to the, to the atlas. And the other guy is really very similar to the atlas. So now it's more easy to, to compare if you're here, you have, it's more likely that you will be in the white matter in both brains and not in the ventricle, in one in, in the one of the other. So this is what this type of transformations may, may look like. Okay, so you, you transform within the brain. But it's true that <coughs> this, this is a, an engineer's trick. And, and for a long time, when we were playing, people that we call today computational neuroanatomists was, were just engineering tricks. So if you want to go transform the brain of one person into another, you, you can just come with a, with a handy trick or you can start asking yourself, what, what, why are the brains of different people different? Okay, why are the brains of different species different? So th there's a, a real biological, neuroscientific, neuroscientific, or just scientific question behind the difference between the brains of the people. So you can either just do your engineering trick and not, not care about it, or you can start becoming little by little like the only anatomists, and then take back the, the real, what would be maybe the natural philosophy issue of neuroanatomy. So what's the origin of the brain? How did it evolve? How, why is it different in, in, in cats, in dogs, in chimpanzees, and, and, and us? Then, for example, okay, here you, you take the cerebral cortex, which is like a very folded surface. You consider it just as a volume. So you, you don't care about the, 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 the existence of the surface. And people started to try to take, for example, that into account. And instead of just looking at the brain as if it were uh, uh, just a bunch of tissue, they started to, to come up with methods that would allow you to follow the, all the surface of the, the cerebral cortex. And then also, which is the, the red line over there. And then also, the, the, the interface between the gray and the white matter, which is the, the yellow line over there that would be surprised, seeing if you were able to see. And then with that, you can build meshes of the brain, like this, and after that, you can, for example, inflate the brain. Okay, so that's adding just a little bit of neuroanatomical knowledge to the to the processing. And, and at the beginning, it was just like a again a handy trick to try to align, to try to compare the brains of different people. But now it was taking some part of the neuroanatomical knowledge into account. <coughs> so these are, for example, some type of reconstructions that, that we can do automatically today. So again, the, the, the main difference may be between the people doing neuroanatomy at the beginning of the 20th century and at the beginning of the 21th century is that the background of neuroanatomy today is very quantitative. Most of the people come from engineering or from, from physics, which was not the case before. These are automatic reconstructions of several subcortical structures. And then this is, a, this is a, a, another method so uh, I forgot to put the names, but I think that we can find this method to, to in particular to these two guys. And again, I'm totally wrong. So the first is a, a French doctor, but also physicist, is Denis Le Vion, the director of uh, Neurospin at the CRA today, who came up with the method to be able to measure the direction of the fibers within the brain. 
So because the, the fibers, for example, the, there's the corpus callosum, the main uh, place where the connections from the right hemisphere go to the left hemisphere and the other way around. So most of the fibers have one single direction. And when you do your MRI, you can see that if you are scanning uh, with a gradient in that, in that direction, you will see a little bit less of signal than if you are scanning in the opposite direction. So it seems that the signal will be affected by the anisotropy of your tissue. And if you scan at different, different directions, you can get an idea of how a single directed are the fibers in one region compared with another. And you can, you can imagine that, uh, so those are called tensors, but if all the directions are equivalent, you can imagine that it's like a sphere. So in a sphere, there's no perfect direction. But if fibers are going like in the corpus callosum from one side to the other, instead of a sphere, you, are, you will have something like an ellipsoid. And here you see that when you are in a, in a big bundle, the, these tensors start to look more directed, which means that most fibers go like this. But here it's difficult to tell. So this may be, for example, the, in, within the, the liquid. So the cerebrospinal fluid is just homogeneous, and you cannot really see a preferential direction. And this is one interesting result. So now we are trying to get, in addition to the gray and white information, we can also have something about the structure and maybe the connectivity of the brain in someone which is not. This is the, the same method uh, used in, in very, very young human babies. So at the beginning, most of the connections are kind of perpendicular to the, to the cerebral cortex, entered like this. But then when they, when they keep growing, they, there are more side branches that start to develop in the neurons, like dendrites, and then the dendrites become more complex, etc., etc. So it becomes less and less uh, anisotropic. Lines are less directed and turn more into 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 spheres. And now, if you 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 can help imagine the, the trick here. If you just follow the lines, for example, here, you would be able to reconstruct what could be the most likely uh, direction of. A uh, fiber, if it were here, and if you get these this beautiful images, so you, you you may know them. So those are the images, uh, which is just a prediction of uh, what what is possibly the connection of a, of a living brain. Okay, it's not really that we're actually follow, following real fibers; it's just a prediction, which comes from the integration of a, of a tensor field. And, and this is how it looks in three dimensions. So this is diffusion tensor imaging. Again, so the method was introduced by, by the leaders young, but maybe, maybe the, the kind of practical use of it in it's the, the picture of the other guy. So Tim Berries, he's quite remarkable, very, very young guy, and he, he invented all the statistical framework to uh, compute the, the connectivity in a brain based on the DTI data. So even if the Nile came up with the, the basic principle, I think that it was uh, Oxford University where they made, made that into something that people could use. And, and maybe even today the most used tool for analysis of DTI is the, the one that this guy is invented. But then I think that, so, again, the, the, the picture there. Uh, there's as it, it were before, so if you remember in the, the, the past neuroanatomy, maybe the, the big issue or, or what, what I would see as the big issue they had was this qualitative, qualitative aspect, you know, very descriptive. And I think that the danger of neuroanatomy today is that it's really very related uh, with, with medicine, So, which wasn't that much the question before. So before it was about the... The, the question were, were, were more scientific. You know, what's the evolution of the brain? Where, where does intelligence come from? What makes a, a species different from another? And here, on the contrary, we're trying to, where people are not that concerned with that type of uh, almost philosophical question, but more with how can we detect the, the neuroanatomical basis of this disease or this other disease, or try to see if that drug is working or not. And, and the risk is making abstraction of all the, the scientific part. And very often, what happens is that people start work, start working with very small sample sizes, you know, because you have just a few just a few patients, and then you try to the, also the culture maybe at the hospital is not the same culture that, that you would see in some other fields, and in, in particular in, in neuroimaging and in biomedical science, you, we are witnessing this type of problem today, which is really very very difficult. Very, uh, so power failure. 
uh, statistical power if you are comparing two populations and there is a difference so there, you don't know but let's imagine that there is a difference if the difference is too small you need really a lot of people to be able to see it okay for example if there were a difference between in, in height between the the french and the the ben, and the ben, John, uh, and if it were very very small maybe you would need 1000 French and 1000 Belgium to, to be able to, to see it but, but for example if you wanted just to measure the difference in height between males and females which is quite, quite it's 10% of the height so you may only need some 20, 20 guys and 20 girls to, to be able to measure it and so the statistical power is the chances that you have of observing a difference that really exists and normally you, have, you should have enough subjects as to have at least 80% chances of, of observing a difference that exists really. Okay? And what happens in fact in the field of neuroscience is that, is that people have only 20% power. So they have so small sample sizes that even if the difference were true, they only have 20% chances of observing it. Because the sample sizes are extremely too small. And in my field, in neuroimaging, the statistical power on average is 8%. Okay. So it would be it would be better for the field if people just took a coin and flipped it like this. Like that, you have 50% chances of finding the right answer. Okay. If, if you spend your money and your time doing your imaging, you have most of the time, on average, 8% 8% chances. Which doesn't mean that everyone is doing neutron. It's just that very often people are doing neutron. It may not only be the case for your imaging, and, and I really, uh, if, if if you. Want to learn more with the work of uh, John Yoannidis? It's, it's really very interesting. So it may be something that's frequent in, in a lot of fields in, in biomedical science. So why must publish research findings are false? So people are running these experiments. They have very little power to find the answer, and it's very difficult to publish a result when it's, uh, when you when you didn't find. So what we call a negative result. But if you find a positive result, it's it's five times. In fact, you can even measure that. It's five times more easy to publish a significant result and a non-significant result, which makes for a big publication bias. Okay, so, and, and here in this paper in particular, which was very, uh, there, there was a big discussion when it was published, okay, you see that the data showing, making that very clear that there is this huge problem with, with publication bias, with spinning the results in the papers, and also with the very weak statistical power. So that, that's one issue. But then there's this other issue. And so taking again with, with the idea of the, the, the neuroanatomical carol, so the, if you remember the story of the, the Christmas carol, there was the tiny team which was this kid that was just very, very shy and innocent and that, that we could really forget. No, it's not really like a, a big, some, I don't know, someone with a lot of influence, it's just a, a, a tiny boy. And I think that, that for the case of neuroanatomy, it's really the scientific part. So maybe the philosophic concerns you neuro know, So what does the brain work is good for? No? What? How do we think? Or where? Where's the? I don't know. What's the? What we would say? You no, know, maybe the, the, the soul in the brain. What? What? Is there any real difference between teams and humans, or etc.? And I think that the risk going too biomedical is to forget the tiny team. <coughs> and so for the neuroanatomy yet to come. The future of neuroanatomy, it's really this is the most biased part, and it's <laughs> maybe the most clear, you know. Uh, but it, it, and it's mostly, so what I think that has to be done is what I think would be done in the future, that's what I'm doing, it may not be the case at all. That's all, and, and I don't have to tell you this a, a lot here at the CRI, you are also very much into, into the same direction. I think that, that uh, working open, it, it will become more and more important. So this is uh, a website called Zooniverse, where researchers propose real scientific projects to the people, So and not because they will be good for it, just because science is important as a, a, a human level, at a personal level, you want to know where you are in the planet. And, and you can participate in real science. So instead of just getting what you are able to read in the papers, you can go, for example, to iWire and help uh, reconstruct the wiring of the retina and, and know better how, how, do we, how do we see. And so in that direction, I have been working in, 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 in several projects. So because we have the standard coordinates and we're able to get that data from every single paper in neuroimaging, now we can write programs that will go 
and take those coordinates from every single paper in, in, in the internet. And this is a, a website, it's breakspell.org, and it's at the time it's indexing more than 9,000 papers. Okay, so it's like, the, uh, uh, I like to think about it like, like the Google for the brain. So the, the idea is there are two main things. So if you go to Brainspell and then you type vision, you will get uh, a list of all the papers that, that correspond to, with the keyword, which you would have in bottom there anyway. But you can also see in the brain uh, where those regions activate most of the time. So you can see that in two dimensions, and then look in different slices of the brain, different different slicing planes, or you can see that at the distribution of those. So where those papers most of the time find a uh, difference or, or brain activity in a three-dimensional model. But then the idea is also, so we can uh, go get the text of the papers and do some text mining and try to see what the paper was about, okay? But the algorithms are, for the moment, not very good. They, they can be improved. So uh, the second idea of, the, of the, this website is to ask researchers to tell us what the papers were about. Okay, so there's a, an interface where you can go to any single paper and then uh, label it. We, we, we have several different ontologies one for labeling the cognitive domains in golf, or one for labeling the tasks. So what researchers ask the, the people to do when within the, the MRI scanner. And then you, you can go and, and, and tag, uh, add labels or tell, tell us how many subjects were involved in the subject. So a lot of different things which are very difficult for a computer to get, but very easy for, for a person to, to get. Uh, and, and I think that this collaboration, doing kind of crowdsourcing, having a lab of thousands of people, but not necessarily all in the same uh, place, uh, will become more and more important. And, and I really hope that comparative new anatomy especially will, will again become an important. So in, in, the, in the pictures that I show you of the museum, it's really amazing. At that time, in the early 20th century, you, you have the impression that comparative neuroanatomy, so try to see what's the place of humans within the rest of the, the diversity, how similar we are and how different we are, was really very important. So they were investing a lot of their time, a lot of their uh, thinking on, on that. And, but if you look today, it's like a dead collection. It's really very sad. I think. So we have now a project with the Museum de Histoire Naturelle where we, are, we will start scanning very soon one brain every day at the Institute de Sao de la Molecinia. So for the moment, if you go, there are just uh, a little bit more than, than 15 grains, I think. And, and you have for each uh, animal, you have a, a little bit of text described who is the guy. And then you can have access and download, if you like, the, the MRI data, which is actually very high quality data with very nice resolution. And there's also a, an interactive three-dimensional model of uh, reconstruction of the cerebral cortex. But we, what we would like to achieve is to have a, a citizen science website where people could go and study these brains, and we could study those brains all together, even if the, the, the NIH or the ESM or the CNRS are not ready to invest money in this type of project. Maybe people that just like the, the brains and know more about that, we can do that without to do that. And then also I hope that the, the quantitative part Will, will become more present. And we have started building mathematical models to try to, to, to uh, propose a, a way in which the, the brain falls. This is some of the, the first results of a brain folding mechanism. And then we can try uh, different parameters and then come, come up with more more thick ideas and just use the same tricks that we have been using to match faces, to match brains. And this is one, one example. And then we are trying to, to figure out how the, the brain folds, and then so how these mechanical aspects could affect the, the organization of the brain with, with a, a nice experiment with the two using, using ferrets. Uh, so I don't imagine that in the future everyone will be using ferrets, but it's just something that I wanted to do. So the ferrets is very interesting. Because of humans, when, when we are born, we have already a, a brain which is completely folded. And if you remember the maps that I showed you, the, the brain folds and the different side of the tectonic regions, these different bands, with different organizations, um, where 
quite strongly related with, this, with, with some of his goals. What's interesting in the theory is that at birth, they, they have a completely smooth brain. No, no faults at all. And then in a matter of two weeks, they start to develop faults uh, quite deep. And, and <coughs> at, at, in the adult, you, you have already a very folded brain, again, with a psychoarchitectonic map that corresponds with this, with this folding pattern. So we will try to describe using magnetic resonance imaging, but also a three-dimensional histology, and I will show you an image later of what it looks like, uh, to really describe all the process of uh, the development of a, of a ferret, brain, ferret brain. And all the data, again, will be available through the internet, so it will not be a resource only for us, it will be a resource for anyone interested in brain development. So here you see some of the, the maps that we have been building, so these are flat maps. Uh, of the uh, anatomy, and, and this is one example of the type of interface that you can have to access this. So at, at the end of the, the brains will be uh, sliced, processed by a robot that will do the, the histology, so cutting every brain uh, slices of 30 microns thick, and then scanning that at a resolution of a quarter of a micron. And so it will be uh, at about one, one terabyte per brain, and all, all the data will be available on the internet. And this is some kind of interface. It's really very much like, like Google Maps. So you can zoom in and zoom out, and it's, very, it's quite fast. And then you can also have a, 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 so you can go and look at that through a graphic interface, but you can also go and look at that with a computer program. So if you want to run quantification, it will be also, also possible. So really my, my, my wish for the future is that neuroanatomy will, will become more quantitative. It will turn again more into something that, like, like natural philosophy. So we will start again uh, asking uh, new scientific questions. And then that it will become open more and more.